Uh, welcome to the lecture on generalization of maps uh, or map data. Uh, and then later on in the lecture, we'll look at data conversion and data quality. Uh, there is a connection between the, these um, uh, between these topics, um, even if they might not seem immediately to connect. But we'll begin with the generalization, uh, go through what that means, uh, why it's necessary and, and how it's done. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll take a break and move on to the other topics. So we're going to uh, learn about the, the, the subject of cartographic generalization. Um, but this is an information generalization as well, which is where we come into this idea of data conversion uh, and looking at accuracy and quality. Um, so we're, we're taking data and we're having to make uh, adjustments to it. We're having to make some decisions about what gets shown and what doesn't and to what with accuracy do we show the data with. Um, that really will influence the interpretation of the map, the interpretation of the data that can be made by the reader. Um, even if we uh, have access to, to all the information uh, in our database, when we present it, either in a printed map or in a digital form, there will be, by necessity, some kind of filtering out generalization of the data uh, beyond what we've already done in order to create the, uh, the, the database to begin with. Um, so let's just stop babbling and move on. What really are we um, talking about? Where do we start from this, this concept of uh, having to go for, uh, to, to, to generalize data down to something understandable, information that we can transfer to others? We've spoken about this before, that we have the real world, a reality out there that is independent of us. Um, it doesn't care that we exist or not, um, and that there are things existing in this world. What those things are uh, is actually um, a highly contested uh, subject, depending on who you are. We have the idea of the conceptual model, which tells us that this, this is more of a, um, a practical model that says, I'm interested in these things. These things for me exist uh, because of my uh, um, the subject, the thing that I'm interested in, whether I'm a physical geographer or, uh, or, or a human geographer or an ecologist or that, that sort of question, where, what am I working with? What data do I need? What, am I going to, what, what eyes am I going to be using when I look at the world? so to speak, regardless of what the world actually is. And these kind of things, the, the real world and the, uh, model and the conceptual model, uh, the, the connections between these we have talked about. If you want an interesting uh, video on YouTube, go to um, Vsauce, um, Michael Stevens' channel, and look at Do Chairs Exist? Uh, interesting uh, film. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with him entirely, but definitely entertaining. Uh, so we have the this idea of that there are things and we want to look at some part of, the, uh, of those things. We want to interpret the world in a particular way. We're interested in certain aspects of the world. Um, so we've said that these things exist. It's not that they don't exist. Uh, let's not get too philosophical, but we, we've made some decisions that, that we say they, they exist and we can, we can investigate the world uh, from that perspective, which connects us to some form of logical model of the world. Um, where we have to somehow measure these things, determine their behaviour in some way. What is it that makes them a thing? Do they follow certain mathematical equations? Um, do they, are they discrete or continuous state? That kind of thing that, that we've spoken about before as well. This, um, the, the, the implementation of our, of our concepts of the world into a more... Uh, rigid describable form so that we have as I said the mathematical uh, formulation or the, the physical equations uh, descriptions uh, as it were of the thing that we are, uh, we, we are investigating and then these have to be implemented into the GIS and for some reason the, 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 the term used here apparently in the literature is uh, the, the physical model when we when we take these ideas and implement them in the GIS, I do not like that name personally. I think that's the wrong name to use, but that's the name. It's a physical model in the sense that we've taken our 
our, our ideas of what the world is and how it possibly can be modelled, uh, and we've made a, a, a made that model physical in the sense that we've put it into the computer. It's, yeah, oh, right. We can we can buy that uh, that name for it. Um, so we've actually created something that can represent the, our idea of the world in a GIS. So we go through these stages to get there. So already we've had to make some decisions about what exists. So we've got rid of some stuff. We're ignoring a whole lot of the world, both objects, behaviors, processes, uh, all of this sort of thing. Uh, and we've said that things can do only certain, they can look a certain way and behave a certain way. Uh, and we've described those behaviors uh, and then we've implemented it. So obviously we've, we've generalized from the actual world already just in doing this. Uh, so this is one, what we could consider a, a primary form of generalization. But what is, just to ex exemplify this, let's look at a, uh, 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 just a, a quick slide looking at what this might mean. Uh, on the left there we have a photograph that is supposed to represent the real world. Obviously it's not the real world, it, it is simply a photograph uh, of the real world being shown on a computer screen. Already we are generalizations away from reality. Uh, but just go with it. Just let your imagination work with this. That, that's a reality. And in that, we can say that there exists some things. We have these concepts in there. We have the, this idea of position and topography, perhaps, and addresses. We, you can live or be registered as existing in a particular part of the world. Um, and then we can then turn that into this, this logical model. We can describe these things with, with coordinates, with uh, mathematical formula to describe uh, continuous surfaces moving from high ground to low ground or from high density of one thing, low density of another. Uh, just these, these, these um, ideas of how the world might behave uh, in terms of this, uh, um, uh, a, a mathematical model or, or a descriptive model. And then we put all of that, we gather data, say the world is going to behave in a particular way because we say so, and put it into a GIS. We gather these data and implement it as a, as a vector file of polygons or lines or points, or we, we collect uh, remote sensing data into, uh, as a raster and that sort of thing. So we, we, we collect our data. This is how we go from the real world into our GIS. And we've gathered up all this data and we've put it into our computer. What next? Well, so then we need to, uh, to display data. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, this is, um, is relevant specifically for, for printed maps, but very, it's still very relevant and in many cases more relevant for digital maps. And this is not something that is uh, uh, only of historical interest, it is actually of current interest and will be of future interest. Uh, how do you represent information clearly to the reader? Um, and Perhaps the easiest way to start is to uh, think back to, to paper maps, which are still in use and are still very useful. Um, do not underestimate the value of a paper map. Um, but we can, we're, so we'll, we'll basically look at this to begin with uh, regarding paper maps, because we have, we can work with a fixed scale then. We don't have to worry about this idea that we suddenly we can use the mouse wheel to scroll in and the map scale is going to change. What can we see and what can't we see? Uh, this is something that has to be dealt with when creating digital maps. When you go onto websites that, uh, are, that have good maps that you can scroll into, zoom in and out of, you will see that the symbology changes. Uh, it will jump at certain zoom levels. You'll be able to zoom closer and closer into the map and then suddenly the appearance will change and they'll start using different symbols in the map uh, to represent uh, other things and maybe new types of things have come into existence. Uh, more on that in, 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 in this lecture. Um, so that definitely exists. These are concepts that still exist in the digital world because we cannot have this continuous flow of changing symbols regardless of the zoom level. We just have to zoom in closer to a, 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 a predefined symbol. Um, so, but, but in, in order to understand this, as I say, we'll kind of look at this um, with uh, using paper maps, as it were, as, as our general conceptual idea. Um, so we, we have, to, have to look at how we can do this under different circumstances. Um, one of the simplest, uh, some of the simplest methods anyway, are the raster methods. When you begin with raster data, 
um, we can do some fairly simple, uh, but by the by necessity they, they are simple simply because of the way a raster data is, is stored. The vector methods um, are more complex, uh, more useful in many respects as well. Uh, these are actually what m m most maps will be using. We'll have a quick look at the raster methods, but it's actually the vector methods where we have objects, where we have things. Remember, rasters, generally speaking, are uh, continuous data where we have uh, um, no distinct boundaries between objects, nothing actually exists, it's just particular values or the particular value in any one location changes and what that value represents is some quality. There are no distinct boundaries, no, no objects. You can't say, I want that thing. There are only pixels or cells, generally speaking. Whereas the vector contains objects. Here we can start to work with generalization, what exists, what doesn't exist. Can we re reorganize the world so that it looks better, so it's easier to understand. And as I said, we can, we can do this um, in different ways. Um, if it's, we're having to do it in real time, if we are talking about a GIS, if we're talking about a digital map, uh, then we uh, need something that's going to be fairly l easy to calculate, light weight, because uh, if we're having to r do a lot of calculations on the fly, it's quite demanding of, of the computer doing that. If, if you remember, um, looking at the soil maps in, in, in uh, on a previous course, uh, these vector soil maps from SGU, uh, they could really quickly overload uh, ArcGIS uh, specifically um, when zooming in and out because it was having to redraw uh, a myriad of different symbols uh, and it was having difficulty handling that. Um, so we want to make sure that our, our symbology is lightweight in the ways that we are um, generalizing our, our lightweight so that the computer is not overloaded. When we're talking about uh, printed maps, it's not as much of a problem because we have time. We don't have to worry about the computer thinking fast now. The computer can take its time, we can take our time. However it's done, we have a little bit more time to get through the process and, and create a nice result. There's, there don't have to be these lightweight, flexible, uh, on-demand uh, transformations or generalizations. They can, uh, we can make sure the job is done well. So what we are talking about then in that sense, in the vector sense, is, for example, going from, we have a map here. This is a very old looking map. This uh, exemplifies some of the problems using just black and white images uh, because uh, black and white maps, which generally we've moved away from, uh, not always, you, you have to be much, it requires even more focus on a lot of the problems that we're going to be taking up in this lecture because everything is represented not by color changes particularly, but by the size of symbols and the placement of the symbols and parts of symbols and distances between them. Uh, so these are a good way of exemplifying some of the problems, but they still apply to color maps very much so, uh, but perhaps this is even more of a consideration when you only have the grayscale map. So as we can see, this map is showing exactly the same area, but at two different scales. Now, obviously the scale here on the screen is Incorrect. If you were to hold a ruler up to the screen now and try and measure this scale, uh, it would be wrong uh, because the screen is changing the scale and the, and the presentation I've created will, created will have changed the scale and so on and so forth. But the map was made to represent uh, to the, this area in 1 to 10,000. This map was made to represent it in 1 to 50,000. And the relative sizes of these are, are correct. Um, but... Uh, the absolute scale that's, that's written there on the screen does not work. Uh, strictly speaking, we should have uh, a, a little scale bar in there to indicate correctly what the scale is, which is why we always tell you when you're making your maps to not really bother with these texts, but actually use a scale bar. Um, so that was a, an example of the vectorization, the scaling, and this is an example of the, 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 rect uh, uh, the raster, uh, generalization, which is essentially, uh, th there are a couple of ways of doing performing different uh, uh, different types of things we can do here. But basically, we're talking about uh, reclassing the data and resampling it. So resampling to different to different pixel sizes, and so we're amalgamating or combining several pixels or several cells, uh, as this is class data, several cells into one larger cell. 
So we go from these 100 meters by 100 meters cells here to 800 by 800 here. So doubling the, the size of one side uh, in each of these steps like this. And so we get fewer and fewer cells, less data to store, uh, fewer details. Um, what's not happened here, we've still got quite a, a, a noisy uh, map, as it were. We can see there's still lots of single pixels and uh, single cells, sorry. Um, but uh, so, so that, this has just been a very crude uh, uh, raster generalization. We're not really going to look terribly much more in this first part of the lecture, at least, uh, at raster methods. We're going to focus much more on the, on the vector methods. Um, so moving on to those, we come to the crux of the matter, uh, and that is this is not simple. Uh, and there is, strictly speaking, no one way of doing things. Um, to, to say something, there, there, there's no absolutely correct way of doing things. There are wrong ways. Definitely, you know, you can always be wrong. But you can never guarantee that you're right. Uh, this is a general problem in in, in life, as in uh, as in many other things. Um, so, how do we do this? Well, we just need to learn uh, some tools uh, and see if we can remember which one to apply, which one we think is going to be best in, in a particular circumstance. And we might need to apply several of them in a chain or in different places, uh, but we need to have this whole suite of tools that we can go to and use. Um, and we have uh, a basic list here uh, that we will now go through uh, in stages, uh, looking at how these work, when they might be useful, uh, and some of the details of how they're implemented. So simplification. Uh, it does, it's basically what it says. Uh, we have, for example, a line that is quite detailed. Uh, we've got lots of data in there, um, and we don't need so much data. Maybe we want to simplify the amount of data being stored, or with so much detail in the line, it may start at, at a particular scale. It might start to look a little, a little messy, and we just want to si simplify things down to the general form. So we remove nodes from the line, for example, so that we can best get uh, represent this line here much more simply like this when we're standing farther away, so to speak, when we've, we've zoomed out, uh, we've, we've rescaled. Uh, so just remove some of the, the points that aren't of, of greatest interest. Uh, and this uh, um, can be exemplified quite neatly um, using the, the, a coastline. This is a coastline of, of Great Britain. Uh, this was used by Mandelbrot uh, to illustrate uh, a point as well. Um, but we have a never-ending amount of detail in a coastline particularly. We can zoom in, as it were, closer and closer. If we use an ever smaller ruler, uh, we can get a longer and longer and longer coastline, which is what this is uh, trying to illustrate here. As our ruler becomes shorter, so the length of the coastline increases as we can get into all the little nooks and crannies uh, and measure all of the curves and indentations all around the coast. And so the line becomes longer and longer and longer. Um, and the question is, how long do you need it? How small does your ruler that you're going to be measuring in each line segment, how long is that going to be? Um, when you're at the, at the standing at the distance uh, you are, at the particular scale you're using, can you actually simplify this down even further? Uh, so this is a, a fairly typical illustration of that. Um, but how do we do it? How do we simplify our waypoints? There are a couple of different algorithms. We're going to look, explore this, this first one, the douglas poiker al uh, algorithm. Uh, it's commonly used. It's, um, the results aren't always terribly pretty, perhaps. We'll see that later on. But it is uh, relatively easy for a computer to calculate. So we, what we want to do is we want to say, we want to determine a tolerance. Uh, what does that mean? Well, how far away from uh, a straight line does another point on our line have to be for us to say it's of interest? Uh, any distance short, uh, uh, shorter than that, uh, we, we don't care about. It's, it's close enough to a straight line so that it can disappear. Anything farther away, well, then that becomes interesting. 
So uh, with that's that, that's our tolerance. So we start by you know, we we simplify the line down to a straight line between the start point and the end point. Uh, and obviously that's a uh, um, not satisfactory or probably not satisfactory. And then we start looking at the, the distances to the point, the actual points, the nodes on, on the line that we're interested in, and to see how far away they are. And we find the one that is farthest away and de determine whether it's far enough away to be interesting. Do we need to go there? <coughs> and if we do, then we then we split our line into, uh, we, we introduce that node, reintroduce it, so, so to speak, back into our line. Now, let's just go through an example in the next on the next slide. So we're going to go through all of these. We're going to start up here. So here we have our line consisting of these 11 nodes. And we want to simplify it because there's a lot of, a lot of details in there. And so we need to do something about that. We need to, to work with that. So we draw a straight line between the first and the last. Good. That was, that's a very simplified form of that line, and we're perhaps not terribly pleased with that simplification. We think we're missing some important details there. We've set a, a, a tolerance, uh, and that tolerance is there. This is, this is our, 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 how far away we, we can be. Uh, and we can see that uh, that is obviously too far away. That point is nowhere near that line. That distance is much greater than this radius here. So that point obviously is of interest. So we want to go there. So we, we, we split this original line and we say, well, instead of, we can't just go straight there, we've got to go to that point because that is that is actually quite an important point. So we'll go there then, we'll head off there. So we now have our line that goes from there to there. Okay, well, are we done with this section yet? We need to, we need to investigate this section to see whether we're done on this first part of the line. We look at that one. Well, that's that's actually when we look at this, that's close enough. That's not terribly interesting. That that line doesn't need to go to that point. Uh, and that one is just about close enough. Yep. So actually, we don't really need to, to do anything about those. Those two points aren't interesting enough for us. They don't add terribly much information. So we can get rid of those. We don't need those. Um, so we'll move on to the next section. This line is done. That can be as it is. Move on to this next section, and the point farthest away is, is number seven up here. Right, so let's let's um, have a look at that. Now, obviously, that's too far away. That's well beyond our tolerance there. <clears throat> so we got to we got to draw the line. So that one we said was okay, but now we need to go all the way out there because that was obviously too far away from this baseline. So we're going to go there. So we've now got our line consists of three segments, uh, and then we. We're done with that one, so now we go on to this segment here. And we look for the point that's farthest away, that's that point over there. And we check the tolerance, yeah, that's that's too far away. So that's too far away, so we need to go there. So we need to draw the line going from there, now it needs to go up there. Can't go straight to 7, it has to go via 5. So we've gone to there. There's, there's nothing there uh, to do, so uh, we look at point number 6. What's that like? Well, we can live with that. That's that's not too bad. Uh, but then we move on to this section here, uh, and we can see that the point there, point nine, is the farthest away, uh, and it's too far away. So we're going to have to go to nine. Okay, so let's go to nine. So we go up to nine, and let's see. When we were going, that line was there. We could suspect that that one was actually close enough to the line, but we've already uh, we've got to go out there. And now, well, quite evidently, you know that's that's going to be too far away. So we've got to go down there, which means that our line in the end goes from there to there to there to there to there to there. We've managed to get rid of one, two, three, four points from our line. Well, that's, you know, that, that's something. We simplified it down. Uh, and we're saying that this new line, this red line, represents in our new scale the information contained in the original line well enough. It doesn't, it doesn't have all the information, but it's good enough for us in our new, uh, in our new scale. So there are alternatives for this, for this simplification. Wang and Muller uh, have an algorithm, uh, which is a list of sort of demands. There is not as, as mathematically simple. Um, there was a fairly simple rule in the, in, in the Douglas Poiker um, algorithm. This isn't uh, quite as simple and straightforward. Um, 
So we, you know, with the, the small bends, what is, what is a small bend that needs to be removed, uh, and just this idea of uh, the two consecutive or similar bends. So just instead of having two objects that look almost exactly the same after each other, combine those into one thing, um, and we and then we can see that uh, what we end up with is a, perhaps a slightly nicer representation. So what's happened here? Is we've we've zoomed in on this this area. This is a, a, a very detailed map up here, and there's too much detail. So when we, that, that's what it originally looks like. And if we want to represent it at a, at a different scale, we could use the the, the Douglas Poiker method here, this algorithm, and we can see that it's it kind of it's a bit angular, looks um, perhaps not as pleasing, doesn't seem to represent, you know, it doesn't. We can see the similarities, but this looks more natural. This looks very unnatural. This perhaps looks more natural. But this was a much harder uh, simplification to perform. This wasn't didn't have the flexibility or the speed uh, of the Douglas Poiker. So con different considerations, different ways of doing things.